right. Welcome, everyone. This is the third webinar in a series of four webinars that are being put on as a partnership between the University of Minnesota Extension and the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. These webinars are all focused on improving future restorations in the state um, and surrounding area. If you missed the first two webinars, the first, really, Restoration Records Matter, and the second, It's All About Teamwork, were recorded. And you can watch those videos on um, the Restoring Minnesota webpage. I'm going to share my screen for a second here. My name is Gina Quirum, and I work with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources with the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. We are one of the partners in these webinars today. I'm going to run through those slides that we're playing if you joined us a few minutes early, just to get us oriented and kicked off for the, for the webinar. We're going to have three speakers today. First is going to be Amanda Hillman. Amanda has a master's degree in environmental science and resources and has been the restoration coordinator for the Minnesota DNR's River Ecology Unit for the last nine years. She primarily is involved in ranking, funding, and coordinating stream restoration projects all over the state of Minnesota. After Amanda gets done telling us a little bit about a recent restoration, a stream restoration at Blue Mound State Park, Molly Trannell is going to join us and tell a little bit more of that story. She is the Regional Natural Resource Specialist for the DNR's Parks and Trails Division. She manages natural resources on parks and trails land in the southwest region of the state through prescribed burning, invasive species management, and native community restoration. She also protects the natural and cultural resources on parks and trails land through environmental review, sustainable development, and project mitigation. So like I said, Molly will jump in and tell a little bit more of the story of the restoration in Blue Mound State Park. And then next, oh, and I forgot to show Molly's picture. Here's Molly's picture. Um, our third presenter today is gonna be Dr. Karen Grant. She is a fluvial geomorphologist in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Her research focuses on understanding how rivers respond to changes from land use change to long-term post-glacial adjustments to rivers in the region. She has extensive experience studying river erosion and landscape adjustment, and will be talking about efforts to bring a wide array of stakeholders together during the research process to help develop a consensus approach to reducing sediment loading in a large watershed. During the webinar, we welcome you to ask any questions that come up please use the Q&A feature to do this. Um, at the end of the presentations, we're gonna have 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So don't be shy, put your questions in that Q&A feature. Um, if you're having a technical issue with the, with the Zoom platform or anything else, you can use the chat feature um, and hopefully one of the panelists can get back to you and get you back on track. We're gonna stop the webinar a couple minutes before one o'clock so that you have an opportunity to fill out a survey. As soon as you shut down Zoom, the survey will pop up and it's a very short survey. Uh, we'd really appreciate your taking the time to do that so that we can think about how to make these better in the future and what topics might be of most interest to you for future webinars. Like I said, these are also being recorded. So if you've missed something, a recording of the webinar is going to be available on the Restoring Minnesota webpage, and you can see this, this Z link um, is where you'd be able to access that. We have one more webinar coming up this spring, and that's going to be two weeks from today. That webinar is going to be focused on lakeshores and rewilding lakeshores in Minnesota, um, and we'll have two speakers for that one. So if you haven't blocked off that time on your calendar, you may want to do that. Just a little bit about the two partners that are helping to facilitate this series. Like I said, one is um, the Ecological um, Restoration Training um, Collaborative, and they uh, have put on the Restoring Minnesota Ecological Restoration Certificate courses. These courses together provide a nice, well-rounded introduction to and refresher on restoration techniques and the practice of restoration. There's gonna be another round of these courses in the fall and registration for those will open up in May, late May or early June. So if you're interested, keep your eye on that. And then the other partner that I mentioned was the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. 
And this is a program that is directed by statute to evaluate restorations that are done with legacy dollars, um, millions and millions of dollars all over the state going out to these projects. And we really focus on collaborating with experts to, to figure out what's working and where there are ongoing challenges and how we can improve future restorations. So, whoops, with no further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite Amanda Hillman to unmute and share her screen to get us started. Hello. All right, we can we can hear you and see your screen, Amanda. Okay. Well, um, so so Molly and I are giving this this presentation on, on planning for success and stream restoration together. I'm really going to focus more on the big picture and you know just the general general sense of stream restoration. And then Molly is going to kind of zoom into the Blue Mounds project and give more details on that one. So when I started thinking about how to approach this, I really started thinking about well, well, how do we define restoration or what is restoration? Um, you know, a lot of times people automatically go to, you know, restoring something to its original condition or making it the way it used to be prior to human disturbance. Well, the streams for prior to human disturbance fit well within the landscape. However, since then things have changed and those same streams wouldn't fit in the current conditions. We've, we've changed land uses and we have changing climate and we've altered our systems. So, so the, that means that we really kind of need to readjust how we think about stream restoration. So um, really what that means is we're gonna focus more so on restoring natural processes and functions instead of that pre-disturbance condition. So the definition of restoration that we use is that restoration is the act of relaxing human constraints on the development of natural patterns of diversity. Whereas restoration measures should not focus directly on recreating structures and states, but rather on identifying and reestablishing the conditions under which those natural states create themselves. So in thinking about doing stream restoration, there's always a do nothing alternative. So there's just some things to consider before you really jump in. And the number one thing that I always think of is, are we addressing those underlying issues or the underlying cause of the problem? If not, it's likely you'll have to go back in at some point in time and do some more work. So we really wanna focus on addressing the underlying causes. Um, is the project exorbitantly expensive versus what kind of ecological gains we're gonna get? Um, is there a significant recovery time associated with the proposed project and that could increase the risk? Um, are there land ownership issues that can't be resolved or will the project cause excessive disturbance, which again, can also increase the risk? So, Moving on to doing restoration, uh, we really have to think in systems. We can't just focus in on one little reach of the stream and say we're gonna do stream restoration. We have to consider the context. Um, so this book by Danella Meadows, Thinking in Systems is really a good read if you, if you uh, have time. And she really lays out three different um, components of the system, the elements. And we've um, worked on a five component framework for watersheds. Um, and then there's an interconnection. So the kind of depicts the interconnections between our five components and then the function of the system. So for watersheds, the elements we focus on are connectivity, biology, hydrology, geomorphology, and water quality. And again, though each one of those can impact the others and, and that kind of illustrates their interconnections. And then they all function together as part of the watershed. Something that really stuck with me in reading this book is the fact that she said um, it's important the important function of any system is to ensure its own perpetuation. But well, that really goes back to that definition that we're using in restoration. We want to reestablish those conditions under which natural states create themselves. In addition to our watershed system, we, we can't you know, just go out to the stream and do whatever we want. We have to work within our human system as well. So we also have the five components of the human system. So we have connectivity, which is our collaboration or communication. We have social, and the big one that, that is usually the first thing that's pointed to is economics. And we also have legal and political boundaries. And then we have that institutional element. So within stream restoration and to have it be successful, um, we need to work within this system. And a lot of the things that come up are funding, collaboration, sometimes politics, education and outreach. Oftentimes there's recreational interests with these stream projects, uh, public support, and then landowner participation. And this is a meeting 
that we had for a big dam project over in Willow River um, was the first outreach meeting with the public to talk about what to do with the failed dam. So in order to, to say a project's successful, I think the, the easiest or the most straightforward way to do that is to set goals, monitor them, and, and to make ensure you're achieving your goals. So that being said, um, goals should be based on that definition of restoration. They should also consider both the human and the, the watershed uh, systems, and they should be detailed and measurable when possible. So these are some typical um, restoration goals, not the detailed version, but the concise version for this 10 minute talk. Um, these typically are a common element and a common theme throughout stream restoration. Um, they involve removing that human constraint, stabilizing the stream, improving water quality, uh, also improving the, the riparian corridor and improving habitat for fish and wildlife. So again, we want to accomplish our goals to show a successful project. So um, monitoring the human elements typically aren't quantitative, but they can be yes or no measurables. Um, and typically they have to be achieved to even be able to do stream restoration projects. Um, and those include um, securing funding and meeting your budgets, um, getting the landowners on board that are necessary, um, bringing in the partners, and then um, improving recreation if that's one of the goals. And these pictures kind of depict the recreational use of some of the projects we've done in the past. Um, this is a dedication done at a dam conversion project and somebody paddling through uh, the rapids here and just simply enjoying the river. So monitoring as far as the watershed, um, here we can quantify and measure. So the first thing and the, the most common thing that we measure is the geomorphology or what we would look at to measure stability of the stream. And I wanna be clear, when we talk about stability of a stream, we don't mean we're gonna dig the channel, we're gonna lock it in place and it's gonna stay there forever. Um, really what we mean when thinking about stability is that it's the ability of the stream over time in the present climate to transport both its sediment and its flows produced in the watershed and, and to do that in a manner that will maintain its dimension and pattern and profile while neither upgrading or degrading. So the stream will move around. And so this is a example of a project we're monitoring. It's a cross section of a riffle structure we put in. And, and we have seen some erosion happening on this side. And without monitoring, we, we, we might not know that, um, but the stream is also building on this side. So what that's, what's that showing is it's sift, this is the down valley side. So it is shifting down valley. And that is something that's naturally see, street, excuse me, seen in streams throughout nature. And this is just an image of the, the building side of the cross section. Other ways we monitor are looking at connectivity, both longitudinally and laterally. So this is a dam conversion project on Fish Lake up here in northern Minnesota, northwestern Minnesota. And this is just a visual assessment of fish using the structure for spawning and for fish passage. We do monitor um, quantitatively sometimes fish passage if we say have a narrow fishway we can actually see in a net. Um, so we have done that in the past as well. Uh, we also document species movement. Um, down here in the lower right is uh, that we've worked with fisheries and other partners and they are doing a big effort to monitor sturgeon movement throughout the Red River Basin. And there we're tagging fish. And then again, um, the lateral and floodplain connectivity is something else that can be monitored. So for biology, um, we look at both fish and mussels and we look at diversity of populations and, and population numbers. And another one that's been a more recent development is that native and terrestrial vegetation establishment. So that's really, Molly's really gonna go into the details of that one. And this Blue Mounds is kind of the first collaboration on this native vegetation establishment monitoring. But we have been working with uh, the Minnesota Biological Society as well to, to identify some sites where we can collaborate on this native vegetation monitoring um, piece. Um, as far as water quality, you can monitor turbidity, DO, temperature, just all depending on what your goals are. And for hydrology, we can look and make sure within channel restorations, we wanna make sure again that that flood flows are accessing their floodplain. Another tool that's um, newer is the stream quantification tool. And this tool is really developed to inform permitting and mitigation. And it's a set of well-defined procedures that um, quantitatively measure and define stream variables. So as far as uh, monitoring a stream restoration, this tool can measure functional lift or the ecological benefits of the project. It can also measure ecological loss in the case of other projects that are impacting the stream in a detrimental way. 
there are five tiers to this model. Um, one, one caveat is that it doesn't account for longitudinal connectivity. So that's just something to think about if you're gonna use this. Um, and they are also developing a stream mitigation bank, which would be similar to the wetland mitigation bank that we currently have. And lastly, um, implementation is critical uh, for good stream restoration projects. The best laid plans um, oftentimes aren't enough. We need to get out there and be on the construction site to make sure that the plans are getting installed the way we want them to. So, and another good thing is to get a good contractor and engineering firm that's, that's um, first in stream restoration or being willing, willing to listen and work with you. Um, and then uh, always there's uncertainty with these projects and oftentimes flooding and other issues can pop up. So we need to plan for that. And with that, I will hand it over to Molly, if I can. <laughs> um, Gina, can you stop me presenting? Um, that is a good question. I think if I, oops. Yeah, if I share my screen, it will force stop you. So there's a, a picture of Cami Krista, everybody. And then I will stop sharing my screen. And Molly, you you are welcome to take I over. Share my screen. Okay. Um, it's always a trick to get the correct screen to show. Okay, let me know. You can see that. All right, we can hear you and see your slides, Molly. All right, like I said, um, I'm Molly Trannell Nelson with DNR Parks and Trails. And as Amanda said, I'm gonna kind of break it down into a, a example of how we went through some of these restoration processes. So how it all began is um, in 2014, we had a huge flood at Blue Mountain State Park. It washed out a historic dam and an impoundment that had been there for over 80 years. So this led to some extensive um, interagency review uh, involving FEMA and all sorts of government agencies. And the decision was made to remove the dam and restore Lower Mound Creek. And so because it involved so many agencies, this process took several years. So while we started with the blank slate right after the flood, what we actually started with when we began restoration looked more like this. Um, we had successional plants established in the basin, but unfortunately we had a lot of reed canary grass, um, cottonwoods were coming in and sandbar willow. And you can see the channel um, had been head cutting for quite a while up the bank or up the basin and they um, had a lot of sedimentation and in incised banks. So this was kind of what we were given to start with. Now design is super important for the success of any restoration. I don't have time to go into the design that could be a whole different talk but I'll just say that um, we wanted to restore it to the pre-dam state um, the dam was put in in the 1930s. So that was restoring the ecological connectivity, the hydrology of the site, um, and doing this with meandering channels. And we also um, felt it was important to include off-channel oxbows, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and part of this was, we were really fortunate that we had experts at our disposable, at, at our disposal. Um, we're a big agency and we have engineers, we have dam safety, we had hydrologists. So we brought in all these partners and um, really helped with the design phase of it. And I think that that really was part of our success was getting all these experts. And with that, they everyone kind of had their own goal of what they wanted to come out of this. So we also had to account for that when we were designing our goals. So one of the most important elements that came out of our design was timing. This project was all about the timing. And this is a drone shot of the day we switched the channel over um, from the old channel to the new channel. And you'll see the meandering channel that was actually constructed a year prior and was allowed to revegetate um, and stabilize for a year. 
And then the day that this photo was taken was the day they were plugging up the new channel or the old channel rather and switching it to the new channel. So that staging and timing was really important. We also had constraints because of um, federally endangered fish species that lived in the stream. So we had certain times we were not allowed to do construction. So our project goals, um, you know, I was coming from it from state parks view. And one of our goals in state parks is to provide habitat for rare species. And this stream has the federally endangered Topeka shiner, um, as well as some other fish species that are rare for Minnesota. Um, we had some snakes on site and um, pond mussels were found as we were doing some surveys. So we really wanted to um, provide that habitat, but then the park also really needed to adapt for future rain events. The climatology data was showing us that we're getting wetter in this part of the state and two inch rains are getting more common. And we saw that with our project flooding several times, both prior to construction and during construction. So we needed it to not fail in a flood and we wanted to reconnect that floodplain to try to make it a sustainable project. And then finally, because we're Parks and Trails, our mission and our mission statement is to create unforgettable outdoor experiences for our visitors. So we wanted to provide recreation at this site and also tell the story of the impaired waters that were going through our park. And so that was also a very important goal. To plan for success, um, we really had to, once we outline those goals, really look at um, what does success look like and how would we define that? So this is just a map that I came up with, um, what I thought the vegetation would look like out there. And I thought success would look like dominating by native species and the invasive species that were currently at the site would be outcompeted. Notice I didn't say they would be eradicated. Um, I didn't feel it was realistic that we would be able to get rid of all the reed canary grass. But if I could get native species competing with it, I thought that would be success. We also needed to cover and stabilize the soils um, as part of our permitting for our stormwater pollution prevention plan or a SWIP, some of you might know, um, you have to get that, that soil covered um, about 14 days after construction. So we had to account for that as well. And then we wanted it to contain a diverse mix of grass, forbs, sedges, and shrubs, but we wanted um, minimal tree species since this is a prairie park and um, it's pretty much a prairie stream. So, you know, I identified these planting zones and made my map and figured everything out, but you're always going to run into challenges. And of course, we did on this project. Um, for example, we had a challenge with local seed source. Um, we couldn't find enough of the seed we wanted, so we ended up with, you know, some of the other things that we had um, available to us. The hydrology was unknown. There were several springs in here. We didn't know how much of this basin would end up in open water or would it be more like a wet meadow. And then we had that um, invasion of reed canary grass that we kind of inherited. So I just wanted to stress here that what we ended up with out in the field was different than the previous map I showed that was how I planned it. So make sure you document what actually happened out in the field. So this is my field map uh, where I write notes to myself and I actually hand this to some of the other people that are helping um, and they make any notes. So for example, our site flooded and we realized that um, there might be a concern that we could have that old channel trying to cut back. So berms were added through that area to prevent that. And so the engineers asked us, you know, can we stabilize these berms? So we put willow stakes out there. So I included that into my um, documentation. And then what I do is I take this back and make GIS um, shape files so that they're not dependent on me not losing this paper map. Um, and then, you know, this we had to prepare for the unexpected and an example of that is right before we demoed the dam, we realized that it was serving as an overwintering site for snakes. So 
at the last minute, we had to um, build an artificial snake hibernaculum. And I don't know about you, but I had never done one of those before. Um, so that's pulling in more experts from non-game program and working with them. And we created what you see in this picture here. It was 13 feet below ground and provided an area that would not freeze in the winter. So um, we trapped snakes um, from the dam area and moved them over. We also uh, made the, con the contractor stop work if they saw a snake while they were digging. We were on site to come in and um, rescue those snakes and move them over to the hibernaculum. And we did monitor this and we found that snakes are using it. Um, after a year, the snakes were finding it on their own and using it, so. So moving into our monitoring, this project has a lot of monitoring because we have so many partners. So US Fish and Wildlife um, has been monitoring Mound Creek for years uh, because of the Topeka Shiners and um, they'll continue to do that for us. And then we have our non-game program monitoring cricket frogs. The last known occurrence in the park was right before the dam was put in. So a great success would be if this species comes back into the park. And right now they're found just nearby, but not in the park yet. And then we're also having some experts um, monitor pollinator species for us in some of the prairie areas that we planted with a diverse pollinator mix. Finally, we have our stream experts doing annual surveys of physical channel conditions kind of what Amanda outlined with the cross sections and longitudinal profiles. And then um, I'll do vegetation surveys of our restored prairie areas. And I'm gonna use a um, protocol that's already been developed with the Prairie Restoration Initiative and their database so that I don't have to um, reinvent the wheel and make my own protocol. And then we also are constantly monitoring for early detection of invasive species. So we did find a small patch of non-native Phragmites. So we'll go in there, aggressively treat that. And just having lots of eyes on the project to watch for those things, especially in a floodplain is really important. And Amanda talked about the human element of this. Public engagement was really important, not just because we are a state park, but because this is the only county in Minnesota that does not have a natural lake. And we were taking away the impoundment that the community had swam in for many years. So we had to involve the community and public stakeholders right from the start. This included both the people of Laverne and the businesses. Rock County um, was concerned about what would removal of a dam do downstream to some of their structures. So we included their engineers in discussions. And then people visit this park from all over the state. So we had to account for other state uh, park visitors. So we did this with both public outreach meetings and um, online public surveys as well. And there was a lot of press release and media coverage uh, for better or worse, and um, that got the word out on exactly our decision-making process. And finally, um, when the project is over, we don't stop engaging the public. The interpretive panels are still being worked on, but they will be placed um, on some of the trails that overlook the project site. And we're gonna tell that story of connecting people to the watershed. So I just wanted to kind of end with a picture of what it looked like on the left uh, prior to the dam being drained, removed. And then on the right, we ended up with, you know, our meandering channel. So, you know, did we succeed? And this is another way I measure success. This is a comment from a visitor that um, visited the park last year. I enjoyed being able to walk on the new accessible path by the stream banks this winter. I saw a multitude of animal prints in the newly fallen snow. During the summer months, native prairie plants are in bloom and are wonderful examples to identify species with. So to me, that's the park uh, visitor really engaging with the site and enjoying it. So that feels like success. And it wouldn't have been possible without all these partners. 
Um, so I just have a list here. I won't go through them, but we had a lot of partners and it was mostly funded with clean water land and um, legacy money. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, both Molly and Amanda. Um, just a reminder to everyone, do go ahead and put your questions for Molly and Amanda in the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we will be answering those questions after Dr. Graham gives her presentation, and she is up next. So I would welcome you to unmute and share your screen. Okay, so are you able to hear me and see my screen? Yes, you are good to go. All right, excellent. Well, I wanna say, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me here to be part of this session on planning for success in stream restoration projects. And what I'm gonna talk about is uh, the role of stakeholder involvement very early in the planning process by walking through a project I was involved in where we got stakeholders involved in discussions actually way before projects even started at the research phase and sort of the large scale watershed management prioritization phase. The project I'm gonna talk about took place in a tributary to the Minnesota River, which as you can see in the photo here is very sediment rich. And the goal was to develop a consensus strategy to reduce sediment loading to the Minnesota River from this tributary. And that required a shared understanding of the science and the management options by a very diverse group of stakeholders over a 3,500 square mile basin. And I wanna start off before I get into that by acknowledging both our funding agencies, as well as my colleagues who helped lead the science and project management aspects of this endeavor. And I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of background about the watershed that we were working in, which is the Greater Blue Earth River Basin to essentially set the scene for how the Scissor Project, as it's known, uh, came to be. Um, the Greater Blue Earth River Basin is down in the southeastern part of the Minnesota River watershed in an area that my colleague Peter Wilcock referred to as the beating muddy heart of the Minnesota River. The data that you're looking at here are total suspended solids yield, and you can see that the highest loads are in the Greater Blue Earth River Basin, and in particular in the Lesseur Basin here on the eastern side. And so if you want to deal with sediment loading in the Minnesota River Basin, you really need to be looking at um, the Greater Blue Earth River Basin and other basins like it. I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit to give you an idea of the geomorphic setting because it becomes important when you start talking about setting priorities for management across this large watershed. This area down in the lower portion of the basin, we refer to as the Nick zone. These are deeply incised uh, river valleys down near the mouth of the river. And it's very common in tributaries that drain into the Minnesota to have this incised zone down near the mouth. And it's related all the way back to the history of the watershed going back to the end of the last glaciation when the Minnesota River Valley was carved by glacial meltwater. And the incision of that valley has been kind of working its way upstream on all of the tributaries ever since. And it leads to this deeply incised lower valley and then the uplands that really don't know that this incision is even coming. So two very different parts of the watershed. And we treat this as a, a kind of a, a fundamental dichotomy to understand what's going on in the watershed. Now, I got involved in this research, um, I think we figured out it was 14 years ago, because I now have a 14 year old and I was pregnant with him at the time. We got involved um, and looking at a sediment budget in the Lesseur Basin. And the idea was to understand where sediment was coming from throughout the watershed so that management options could best target the different uh, sources. So we set up the sediment budget to be both above the Nick zone and below the Nick zone. So we looked at those separately and there were four major categories of sediment. There were upland sources, which in this watershed means the sediments primarily coming off of agricultural fields, stream banks and bluffs, which are primarily distinguished by their height. And in, in terms of a sediment budget, erosion of a bluff is generally adding excess sediment to the river, whereas erosion from stream banks is sometimes um, uh, equilibrated with deposition in the floodplain. But bluffs are a net source of sediment. And then we also have ravines, which are these first and second order, very steep channels, often ephemeral, that can have really high sediment concentrations, but they're also very limited spatially within the watershed. 
And the results of this showed that most of the sediment was sourced within the incised nick zone and that the dominant source was coming from near channel erosion from bluffs and stream banks. I know there's a lot of stream restoration practitioners here who have um, knowledge and ideas of how you can reduce sediment loading that's coming from stream banks and from bluffs. Um, but I think it's important to recognize what the underlying cause of this is, which Amanda alluded to in her presentation. And that in this particular watershed, a lot of the underlying cause is changes in hydrology. So it's not just that you have stream bank erosion, but you have more now than we did in the past because there's a lot more water moving through the rivers now. And it's due to a combination of land use change as well as climate change. But fundamentally, we have more erosive rivers than we used to. And so if you look at this um, from the perspective of trying to reduce sediment loading, you could tackle erosion on stream banks and bluffs. You could tackle hydrology, um, like retaining water in the upper parts of the watershed. Ravines and uplands are not negligible. Ravines is about five to 10% of the sediment load in the watershed and the uplands were about 20 to 25%. And these all bring in very different management options. So we have a really wide array of ways to approach this problem. We could look at specific sources and work on maybe bluff stabilization or ravine tip stabilization. We could look at different um, best management practices that are traditionally used on agricultural fields. So ways to reduce erosion or reduce sediment delivery from fields to streams. Or we could look at a range of different kinds of hydrology management options. And this is spread over a 3,500 square mile basin. And the questions that were coming up, where should we focus management actions? How do we develop a watershed management plan? And how do we prioritize funding? And the we in here is not the group that I was working with of you know, the bunch of scientists who are out here studying this. We in this case is the citizens, the agency staff, the state, all the people who are in the Minnesota River Basin. It involves landowners, nonprofits, a whole bunch of different counties, um, all the agencies at the state level. Everyone needs to have a, a, a role in this. And in part, the different actions that can be taken often are you know, involve a very different group of people uh, taking those actions, whether you're talking about BMPs on farm fields or stream restoration projects to stabilize bluffs. So it was from this that was born CISR, um, which stands for the Collaborative for Sediment Source Reduction. The goal of CISR was to identify a consensus strategy for reducing sediment loading in the greater Blue Earth watershed using a decision framework that incorporates the best available scientific information, accounts for uncertainty, and provides a model for decision-making throughout the Minnesota River Basin. CISR was fundamentally the brainchild of my colleague, Peter Wilcock, and he felt very important that everyone have a seat at the table. He got a whole bunch of different agency staff and stakeholders together before we even launched into this project and um, walked through what he thought we could help with, right? We could help expand our understanding of the sediment loading, erosion, and deposition throughout the watershed into the greater Blue Earth River Basin from our, our understanding of the Lesur. We could help develop a model that would allow you to put management actions on the, on the landscape and look at the reduction in sediment load and the cost associated with that. But everybody needed to be involved. And so these agencies and um, organizations at the bottom are the people who helped fund the CISER project. So this everybody being involved came all the way back to the very first step of writing a proposal and getting it funded. So we sent the same proposal off broken into chunks to the Minnesota Agricultural Water Resource Center, uh, the MPCA to two different um, funding sources. One was Clean Water Land and Legacy Funds. The other were 319 funds from EPA and also the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And it felt a little bit like a house of cards because anyone could say no and the whole thing kind of collapses. Um, but everyone helped, everybody put money forward. They also put a lot of time and effort forward because at the heart of Scissor is the collaborative, which was the stakeholder group. And so the stakeholder group was designed to meet twice a year. The goal was to meet about seven times over three years. And the idea is that we would be doing the research and building the model, which was the other pillar of this, which I'll get to in a minute, collectively and collaboratively with this stakeholder group. So we wouldn't just come in at the end of the project and say, well, here's what we know, let's figure out what to do, but people would be involved all the way along. Um, this is, the stakeholders came and went, we had some very dedicated people who were there the entire time, 
right? The intent was actually seven meetings over three years. It ended up being nine meetings over five years. Sometimes things take longer. Um, these are the people who were at the last meeting. And so there were landowners and farmers. There were county agencies, state agencies, uh, nonprofits, uh, Corn Growers Association. We tried to get a diverse mix of interests and a diverse mix of people involved. So the stakeholder group was front and center um, of importance in the scissor project. And then kind of the other pillar that it was built on was this model, the MOSM model, Management Options Simulation Model, which fundamentally was a water and sediment routing model, um, which eroded um, land across the watershed, delivered that sediment to the rivers, uh, moved it downstream, allowed it to deposit, et cetera. And then also management options. So we can put different management actions on the landscape, and I'll explain in just a minute how those were chosen uh, at different extents, costs, and effectiveness. And the ultimate goal was to run a series of scenarios to figure out how much sediment reduction you would get and at what cost. There's a couple of things that were different about MOSM than kind of a standard watershed model like SWOT or HSPF. Um, it was very much a data-driven model. Most of the effort that went into this was in collecting the data from across the watershed of where the sediment sources were, what were the rates of erosion, what were the sediment delivery rates, what areas across the watershed could be used for different kinds of management options so that we weren't kind of over-promising. We'd only use areas that were able to be used. And, um, and it, all of that fed into the model. It means that this model was really developed for this process in the greater Blue Earth River. It's not something you could pick up and plunk down in a different watershed. It was designed to be fast, right? The goal was to be able to actually compare portfolios of different actions in real time with the stakeholders. So they not only helped us provide feedback in which we used to build the model, but they also could run the model during meetings. And it accounted for costs and benefits in a very transparent way. It was actually run through an Excel spreadsheet and you could change the values on there if you felt that the costs, for instance, were inappropriate for the area that you were working in. So it was designed to be very transparent about what went into it. This is the scissor umbrella. I was trying to figure out a way to illustrate sort of how this process was a little bit different than a lot of research projects that I've been involved in. Um, oftentimes, as the scientists, we are given a task or we come up with questions, we conduct research, maybe we build our data-driven model, and then we meet with stakeholders to communicate those research progress and the results. And the idea is that by communicating what you've learned, you can develop shared understanding and then maybe use that to build a consensus strategy. The problem is that if you're coming in at the end and communicating your research progress and results, you're not really developing a shared understanding. People don't really know where it came from necessarily. Uh, they don't know all of the ins and outs. Maybe there's something they would have done differently. So it's really hard to get to this consensus strategy, particularly in areas that are pretty contentious. So Scissor was designed with the stakeholder group assembled first. And the stakeholder meetings were a really important part of the process. We still did research, we built a data-driven model, and we communicated our results, but we were having these communications you know, every couple of years throughout the process. And that allowed us to solicit feedback and then incorporate that feedback back into both the research process as well as the data-driven model. And I think that allowed for more informed iterative research um, to occur here. And the other thing is we weren't just getting feedback, but we actually designed this model to be used with the stakeholders during these meetings. And that really helped reinforce the shared understanding. So the shared understanding was built iteratively over the years, but also by being able to have a say in what went into the model, to know how it came to be, and then to be able to use it, that really helped have sort of a stronger foundation on which to develop this consensus strategy. So the management options that we put into the model were chosen to represent categories of options. And these were done in consultation with stakeholders. So what do I mean by categories of options? I mentioned a few sort of upland best management practices earlier. Some of them actually reduce erosion on fields, things like moving towards more no-till agriculture or putting in cover crops, while others reduce the sediment delivery from fields to streams. And those would be things like grass waterways or buffers. Um, buffers is an example of something that was added um, with stakeholder input in the middle of the process because Governor Dayton's buffer initiative came out then. We also had categories of options that uh, allowed for reduction of sediment load from ravines and from bluffs. And then we added in 
uh, hydrology management as well. And that could include both permanent um, hydrology management, like restoration of wetlands, or temporary, which uh, the stakeholders were particularly interested in. And that would be things like um, in-ditch storage, places you could hold the water back for you know, two to three days. When running the model, you would set a, a variety of scenarios that allowed you to apply these different kinds of management actions over large swaths of the watershed. So although it was tied to specific sites in the background, uh, we weren't looking at putting specific projects on specific sites. This was more allowing us to get at whether it made more sense to you know, go after putting in riparian buffers or more water storage or more bluff stabilization. And this is the kind of results that would come out, we'd get an annual cost over an annual sediment load reduction. And ideally you wanna be down in this corner over here where you have high re load reductions for lower costs. And you can see that some of the different combinations of scenarios um, performed better in that respect than others. These green ones are things like the riparian buffers and grass waterways, which um, were not as effective at reducing sediment loading. It doesn't mean they're not effective at other things, um, but for sediment loading, um, the upland sediment load wasn't as high to start with. And so by being able to run this model with the stakeholders during the meetings, they could actually choose scenarios, test them out, see what the results were, hit go, come back to it and, and try changing things. And I think that really helped us to get to the point where we did achieve consensus and the consensus document was pulled together at the last meeting. And there were sort of three pillars that came up. And one was that ravines could be targeted for, to reduce sediment loading. This is something people really were very um, interested in pursuing, but I came with the recognition that you couldn't solve the excess sediment loading problem through ravine stabilization alone, because they simply aren't a large portion of the watershed. Bluffs could be targeted, um, particularly ones that are eroding a lot or about to erode into infrastructure. And water storage needed to be a part of this discussion. And I actually copied the text from that because I think this was one of the more important outcomes of this process was that achieving water quality standards will require priority investment in more temporary water storage to reduce high river flows and bluff erosion. And this is a critical component of a strategy to reduce sediment in the Minnesota River. And since then, there have been a lot of projects that have come out to try and manage water on the landscape. There's been manuals that have been released. This is Fields to Streams, which was put out by the U of M Extension. And water storage is becoming a focus of several agencies and uh, local watershed groups. There were bills moving through the legislature this session that I admit I have not kept up with the status of them, um, but I feel like it's really been elevated in the conversation. And so I'm just gonna finish up with a few lessons learned. Um, I know our time is getting tight. Um, from the scientific perspective, right? I'm a researcher. It was really helpful to have feedback while we were still doing the research and building the model. You could add in things that maybe you wouldn't be able to add in if you came at it um, and got that feedback too late in the process. I think it's very important to be upfront about what you know and what you don't know. And this is something that I always try to do when I'm talking to mixed audiences, like what specifically of this statement do we have a good understanding on and what do we not? And this model was developed with uncertainties built into it. So you could actually see what the range of variability was in the outcomes. Um, vaccines notwithstanding, science can be kind of slow at times. And there were some management options that arose later in the process that we weren't able to add. There was interest in the water holding capacity of soil organic matter. And that was something that there wasn't enough research out there for us to be able to add that into the model at that late stage. Having a facilitator can be really helpful, like a professional facilitator. That's not something we did early on. And um, I will, in, in the being upfront about what you know and don't know, I actually missed the last meeting where people put together the consensus document because I was home with the flu, but they had a facilitator that came in and said that was particularly helpful. And then the last two, Consensus is achievable by a diverse group of interests and having a consensus can help move initiatives forward, particularly at this large scale where everybody's coming in with very different interests. And I think I'm just gonna end there by acknowledging all the other sort of science crew that were involved in this at some stage along the process and also thanking state and local agency staff for all of their work along the way. All right, thank you all. That was all very interesting. Um, so I appreciate the efforts of our speakers to bring their um, projects to us in this format. 
Um, we have a lot of questions today, so we'll dig right into that. Um, so for Molly or Amanda, um, one of the participants says they love this project and they're curious if the environmental review process was a benefit of the public engagement or if you found other mechanisms that were more successful at getting the community input. You'll be sure you unmute yourselves. Just Molly, I can take that. Um, I think that the, the environmental review process wasn't as important as the fact that we had data showing that the stream was impaired. And um, once we could show the public that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency does not recommend recreation, you know, swimming in this stream, then it was kind of um, a no brainer that we weren't going to put an impoundment back in. So I think that was really the turning point with the public because there was very strong support for putting the dam back originally. Um, and so once we are able to show some of that um, data and there are all sorts of um, water quality issues in this part of the state. And so that um, once we kind of told that story, I think that helped. And can you address Molly, um, after the stream restoration was completed, um, did you see an increase in some of the species of concern? So the Topeka shiners, for example, and other species? Has your monitoring um, demonstrated that? We'll know more actually this summer because last year they couldn't survey because of COVID, unfortunately. Um, so we're missing a year of data. Uh, but we are finding, um, especially with Topeka shiners, in an oxbow project we did just outside this project area, they immediately recolonized it um, like within a year and that floods actually helped them recolonize these off channel habitats. So we, while we don't have the data for our exact project area, it's looking like that they really quickly um, recolonized that, so. Yeah, I just was gonna add that the project was just finished, was it, was it the end of 2019 or early 2020? So it hasn't, hasn't been done that long and yeah. shortly thereafter we were all kind of staying at home. And Dr. Grant, can you address um, what the process was like for um, identifying the stakeholders that you engaged in your project? And were there any groups that were reluctant to participate? And thirdly, did you have any um, participation by tribal entities? Yeah, so the, the partners that were identified initially were ones that we had worked with um, for the Lesur project. And we expanded that out into um, more sort of local and state agencies. Uh, I think we also very much wanted to get growers associations and farmers um, to be a part of the conversation. So not just the regulators, but also the people whose land um, was involved in this. Uh, so how were they identified? I guess it was sort of one by one. I was talking with people who should be here at the table. I know there were groups that we did not have early on that we identified that we needed to add. And so there were more nonprofits that were at that last stakeholder group meeting than were at the beginning, at the earlier ones. Uh, there was not tribal involvement and there should have been. That is our fault that we were not, um, did not reach out to them early enough. And then the last question, are there stakeholders who were reluctant? Well, you know, we actually had some folks who came to the stakeholder group meetings who um, were maybe less participative than uh, than others that, that were there in part to question the, the science that was coming out to question the process. And so working through that and working with them um, was challenging at times as it often is. Um, but I felt like everyone needed to be there at some, at some level. So we were trying to get a group of people who, who wanted to work together, but to get people who had differing interests coming into it. There are some initiatives in the state to have, um, you know, increased buffer zones along creeks and things like that. Did you get a sense from these, from your meetings, whether or not a stick or a carrot would be a better way to motivate action? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. No, so the buffer initiative was just coming out as we were having these meetings and people were really interested in what it would do for sediment loading. So that what we were able to offer was sort of the, the information on it is actually not the most effective way to reduce sediment loading. It may have other purposes. Um, the carrot versus the stick. 
I mean, most people don't like sticks, but uh, <laughs> I don't I don't have the answer for that. Um, back to um, the Mound Creek project. Um, so Molly or um, Amanda, can you address whether who who exactly was involved in the physical restoration of that? I mean, how big was that team, and were there aside from agency participation in that? Were there other contractors? And um, I'll leave it there. I can take a stab, and then Amanda can add any that I miss. Um, it was a pretty big um, group, and we actually contracted um, with Bar Engineering to oversee the project for the DNR. And um, Landware was the contractor and we had required a contractor that had done projects of similar scope and type because we knew that we didn't want a first timer on this project because of all the um, stakeholders involved in the scrutiny. And we had everyone from um, people scuba diving for pond mussels and um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, allowing us to use their staff to get the Topeka Shiners um, to all sorts of engineers on site at all times. So it was a pretty wide um, variety and I was just very lucky to have those experts at my disposal because this was my first stream restoration and it was a pretty complex project. So yeah, we, and I would say to anyone who's gonna take on a project that's complex like that, you can't be an expert in everything. So that's where those partners really um, were important. And, you know, we're lucky that we have people within our agency who, who do these projects on a regular basis. So they were really key to um, really keeping the project successful. We do have a lot more questions, but I think at this point I need to turn it over to Gina for the, the last um, closing kind of mop up. Uh, great, thanks, Julia. Um, and for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, um, if you want to reach out to either myself or Julia, we could potentially try to um, loop you in with the speakers. Thank you all for your participation today. Like I said, there's one more um, webinar left in this series two weeks from today on rewilding lakeshores in Minnesota. And once you leave the Zoom call today, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. Again, we would really appreciate your time taking this short survey to help us plan for future webinars. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.